Welcome to us, I guess. Um, I, my name is Dr. Michelle Johnston. I'm looking forward to this session with the titans of clinical reasoning, um, Art and Nick, and I'll hand over to them. Sure, thank you, Michelle. Thanks, everyone, for, for coming to our session. Um, before we get started, I guess what we probably should tell you a little bit about the process and what you're about to see. Uh, some of you may have listened to the podcast and heard when we do a Stump the Chumps. Uh, this basically just means we're the chumps and someone gives us a case and we try to solve it. Um, so the, the way that this has been set up for today is we have received the case already in bits and we've stopped at those bits and we've articulated on paper and, and elsewhere some of our thinking. Uh, and then moved on to the rest, to the other bits of the case, and we just kept on going down the case until we came to what we thought was a, a resolution. We hope it was hope. a resolution. Um, but we don't know, so we don't know the final answer yet, but uh, we, we do have all the clinical information up until that point. So what we're gonna do today is we're just going to uh, share with you that, that process that we went through and, uh, and our thinking as we go through the case. Fantastic. So this case has been kindly donated to us uh, from uh, Casey Parker from Broom Dogs, who a lot of you would be aware of. Um, and uh, so my job is to drip feed these chaps, as are these titans of clinical reasoning, and see what they can come up with. Um, now, of course, we know that medicine is never competitive. Uh, so no, this is obviously all just for education, uh, far be it from us to ever want to try and stump anybody. Um, so with that, we might get straight on to the case. And I have here for you the case of Ms Gwendolyn Dartmouth Merman, who was a 60-year-old resident of Broome. For all her life, she's experienced good health and lives a very clean lifestyle as a vegan. She doesn't consume eggs or dairy products. She has two adult children and is separated from her long-term partner of 25 years. She lives alone. Gwendon is an avid practitioner of yoga. She meditates twice a day in the Buddhist tradition and travels uh, to Western Japan for a spiritual retreat annually. She's an artist and makes a living selling her paintings, mostly depictions of Buddha, in warm flowing robes, sculptures and handcrafted jewellery at the lo local open air markets. And I managed to find some examples of her lovely pieces that she tries to sell. Unfortunately, sales have not been vast. <laughs> um, here's another, this is from her Van Gogh uh, era. She owns a large block on the outskirts of town. Gwen enjoys gardening and grows a large vegetable and herb garden. She tries to be self-sufficient and organic. She drinks water from her own well. She has concerns about fluorinated public water. She spends her days working on her creations in her studio behind her house. She does grow a small amount of cannabis, but only smokes it on special occasions with friends. She does not drink alcohol. Does she inhale? Or not? <laughs> oh my God, no, no, no. I don't no, think no, anyone no. got that actually. <laughs> <sighs> so the story we have, uh, dear Gwendolyn, uh, she's presented for the third time in a week to the ED, the GP, and now the GP again, with increasing pain in her lower back, hips, and upper thighs. And I'll pass it over to our friends. Do you want to try? That's just the green. So um, you might be wondering why we've stopped at this point in the presentation, because we don't really have all that much clinical information. Um, but one of the things that we do and we teach and we, and we say over and over, over again to our trainees is that um, they need to, at various points along the, the course of hearing a case, come up with problem representations. And by problem representations, we mean short, succinct statements that in a medical jargon sort of describe what it is that we're trying to solve, okay? Um, so that we can then work on a differential diagnosis. So our problem representation at this point in time is that we've got a 60-year-old uh, healthy vegan woman with progressive pain in her lower back, hips, and upper thighs uh, for three months. I mean, it's sort of a subacute um, coming into more chronic sort of presentation. And from that, 
Even without getting any more information, we like to try to generate differential diagnoses. Now, when I was accepted to medical school, I was for many, many years thereafter, and sometimes even today, convinced that I was a clerical error, that my, my application to medical school was in the reject pile, and somebody came by and knocked all the papers on the floor, and as they were collecting them back up, mine was put in the accept pile, because I thought, I can't come up with differential diagnoses like many of my mentors, like all of these smart people, until I realized that there are methods and there are shortcuts that we can take to come up with differential diagnoses. So for pain... Actually, um, just, just before we get into the, this actual differential, the, the other thing to say about the problem res representation is that it is, as Art mentioned, it's, it's a, sort of a crystallization of the key features of the case. But you can also think of it as if you didn't have an illness script for what you're hearing, if you didn't, it didn't immediately come to you what the diagnosis might be, you might go onto Google and what you put in your problem representation actually should be what search terms you would put into the Google line to come up with the diagnosis. And we may not have enough information at this early stage, but that's what you're trying to do with the problem representation at every step. So my approach to coming up with a differential diagnosis for pain is to just think anatomically. Now, I guarantee you guys know far more anatomy now than I do. I do not remember anatomy, so I'm talking about very, very simple stuff. I think of what's in that area where she's having pain. Um, there are certainly bones, um, and when, with bones, I then sort of think very simply pathophysiologically. Um, they can break, they can become infected, they can be destroyed by um, sort of lytic lesions, or they can have infiltration in the marrow that destroys them. Um, they can break from either trauma. People can have osteoporosis or, or osteomalacia. There can be nutritional reasons why that's the case, or there can be a pathologic fracture. So I think bones, what else could be causing this woman's pain? Possibly joints. At this point in time, it could be muscle, nerves, it could be a vascular problem. Um, I've certainly seen people with aortic dissection presenting with vague uh, uh, symptoms, although this is going on for a little bit long for that. Um, pelvic pathology, certainly, uh, ovarian pathology, endometrial pathology, and then obviously there's retroperitoneal spaces as well. Um, so I think, of, uh, I think uh, in a very sort of anatomic approach, and this is sort of the, my back of the envelope, back of the napkin uh, differential diagnosis. The, the one thing I will say just before Michelle goes on is, for some reason we were given a lot of social history right at the beginning, and that's not usually how we get a, have a case presented to us. We, we get that first line, and then maybe the social history comes a little bit later. So I don't know if that's... Uh, Casey trying to make an example of that we should always think about these things, or, or trying to if lead us astray, lead it, or give us a clue. Well, or she was possibly something. just so fascinating uh, that we all needed to know about that. So we will we'll find out shortly. So let's carry on a little bit more and give you a bit more story. So this pain has been slowly increasing over the course of at least three months. Initially, it was intermittent, but now persistent. The discomfort is to the point where she's walking in a slow waddle. She's not been able to do many of the yoga poses that she's so proud of, um, and gardening is now impossible. Her naturopath has prescribed a combination of turmeric powder and copper daily. She thinks that this has helped her a little. She's been feeling somewhat lethargic and run down, which is unusual. She does not think she had any fevers, night sweats, chills or rigors. She's sleeping okay, more than, a little more than usual. She's not had any weight loss, although she's very thin. This is long term. This is Essentially, it's a very unrewarding systemic inquiry. There's no history of trauma, no abdominal features at all, diarrhea, constipation. She's got a little bit of nocturia, but no dysuria incontinence, no headaches, no visual disturbances, no respiratory symptoms, no chest pain, blah, 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 blah. It goes on, it's all good, nothing much wrong. Gwen has noted that she seems to be losing her smell. The incense candles that she burns each day are difficult to appreciate. Hmm. She doesn't have any joint symptoms other than her lumbar spine and hips. Gwen is 
postmenopausal by 10 years, has had no PV bleeding or climacteric symptoms. Oof, that sounds ugly. For five years, she's never had a fracture of the hip, wrist, or spine. She had two uncomplicated pregnancies um, in her uh, 20s, and you can see that her sons, one's a hedge fund manager and one's a real estate agent. How incredibly disappointing for Gwen. <laughs> um, she, her anemia was thought, she's had a bit of anemia, thought to be diet related. She had a bit of iron, follow up, hemoglobin, those okay. She's never had any immunizations as an adult because very, very concerned about the mercurial salts used in the production and she's had no history of cancers and the medications were just as you'd heard the turmeric and the copper okay which, which is, is it the, green? the big green the one. big green one okay all right so the next step with this other bit of information is once again we want to reformulate and this is something that we want to do often throughout a case when we get more information we're reformulating and optimizing that problem representation. And again, it's about choosing the key features. So in this case, what we came up with was 60-year-old healthy v vegan woman. For some reason, we always mention vegan in there, but it's a little bit alarming sometimes when you hear that. With, um, with chronic, progressive, persistent low back pain, uh, hip, upper thigh pain as well, limiting her mobility, which I think is an important point. And it's been going on for three months. And now we know that it's associated with generalized lethargy without fevers or weight loss. Now, one of the things that makes this case challenging, but you know, many cases that we encounter challenging is knowing how to separate the, you guys can see the depiction there of the elephant in the room versus the red herring, right? What is actually important? What is relevant? And we don't know, actually. We, we've chosen, if we go back to the problem representation, to make these the key features based on what we've heard so far. But there are some questions here. So the anosmia, the, the, the losing the sense of smell, um, you know, what, what could that represent? Uh, is it relevant to this case? If we really stretch ourselves, you know, anosmia, we, I sort of think about in terms of it could be, it's either a local problem in the nose, and a lot of different processes can cause that, or it's something neurological. Uh, and it often can just be a feature of getting a little bit older. So, that, so is it important? I, we don't know. Neurologically speaking, we could think about Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, something in the brain, something else in the brain. And then the local stuff, you can think about simple things like chronic rhinitis. She has said, didn't she say that she had in the, in the case that we, the, yes. in the written case, yep, that Casey sent, he, she did have those things, chronic sinus congestion, cough as well, right. and a previous anemia. But other things can affect the mucosa, which ultimately leads to loss of sense of smell. You know, and this is a stump the chumps case, so we're, we're trying to think of weird and wonderful things. It's called the stump the chumps bias. We've coined it. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're thinking of weirder things and things like Wegner's or GPA. Uh, thinking about sarcoid infiltration, which can also be associated with those, um, those aches and pains and other inflammatory bits, right? Um, do you want to say something about the nocturia? No. Okay. <laughs> Perfect. Um, previous anemia. The, from the beginning, and this is, this is why I was getting at the social history a little bit early on, why are we hearing about all this stuff in the social history? She drinks from her own well. She is very organic. You know, she, maybe this is something so simple. She does so much yoga that she sits in weird positions and is exacerbating something in her hips. Um, maybe this well drinking is a, is a factor. I don't know much about Broome, where she lives, whether there's stuff in the water. Um, so that's something that we sort of thought about. But none of it is really fitting yet into a pattern. No, and the copper ingestion, I mean, you know, people who take copper may take other things. There's lots of Ayurvedic medicines out there that contain various other things. So that, that struck me as a little bit interesting. But I don't know how to, at this point in time, I don't really know how to fit all those things in. I'm not sure which is the elephant in the room, which are just red herrings to sort of throw us off the scent. So this is sort of where we're at in, in our thinking about what we've heard so far with the details of the case so far. Um, it doesn't sound like it's on the right side of that differential diagnosis. It doesn't sound like it's an, an internal organ thing because we haven't been able to um, come up with any clues in that direction. It doesn't sound like an infection 
there's no fevers. It's been going on for a little bit too long. I mean, obviously there's chronic infections, but it's not, it doesn't really have that flavor. But we still have musculoskeletal stuff uh, in general, and then it could be inflammatory, it could be degenerative. Uh, we haven't heard of trauma per se, but you know, there's a few things there that we haven't ruled out, but it's really starting to sound more like it's on that, the, the left side of that differential. Yeah, we haven't ruled out pelvic pathology, certainly, but there's no weight loss, there's no gynecologic symptoms, uh, there's no abdominal symptoms, really. So um, I think this is, at this point in time, seeming more like a musculoskeletal problem. Mm. And one would ask, why broom? And what is particular about broom? So maybe while, you're, while these guys are doing all the hard yards, maybe you should all be thinking too, what, what particular things might occur up in broom that might be contributing to what is sounding, I agree at this stage, like a fairly non-specific uh, presentation with just a few little abnormalities in there. Anyway, we're going to go to the examination, which I've written up there is lamentably unexciting. Her vital signs are all normal. She's a thin woman with a typical northern Aussie sun-damaged skin, no pallor, jaundice or peripheral stigmata of chronic illness. Her hands show evidence of a bit of osteoarthritis with symmetrical Hebbidens nodes of most fingers. Her dentition a little yellowed at the crowns, no caries. Looking at the ENT examination, no lymph nodes. The pharynx is normal, um, no ulcers or evidence of recent infection. Her nasal passages do appear slightly inflamed. I think you did mention that. Um, interesting. Uh, no masses or discharge. The thyroid exam is unremarkable, no palpable masses or goiters. Uh, Oh, goiter, I think you'd only probably just get one, wouldn't you? Sorry. Chest clear, heart sounds dual, no murmurs, strong peripheral pulses, no AAA. Abdomen soft, scaphoid, no organomegaly or lymphadenopathy, lumbar spine, now it's getting interesting. Painful on extremes of range of motion, tender to palpation over the bony prominences, and hips, she's got a reasonable range of motion, but she's quite tender over those greater trochanters. No active arthritis or warm, jo warm joints. Neurological examination, her cranial nerves are all normal apart from marked anosmia, and I take my hat off to anybody who actually tests for anosmia. Might have just been, mind you, you know, I, I work in emergency departments and, uh, you know, we're doing like a constant check of people's <laughs> nasal, uh, you know, competence, if you like, and it's not very nice. Um, no visual field defects, normal tone or limbs. Her power may be slightly decreased in her quads, hip extensors, normal reflexes, fundoscopy normal, la la la. So really pretty unexciting. I'll give it back to you guys. Where so, are you uh, going to take it from there? So a couple of things struck me there, Michelle. One is that um, you know, one of the things we had on our differential was the possibility of vitamin D deficiency, but she's got Aussie sun damaged skin, so that would seem very unlikely. She has Hebbidens nodes on her hands, which could suggest the possibility of some sacroiliac uh, arthritis. Um, and even though her uh, sort of physical exam was unexciting, there were lots of pertinent negatives there, actually, that I think um, are, are pretty important to consider. So we had talked about pelvic pathology. It doesn't seem like there was anything abdominally going on. So um, I think it was, it was helpful. So at this point in time, um, our problem representation is morphing a little bit, getting a little bit more detailed. Uh, so this, again, is a 60-year-old woman, healthy, vegan, uh, with chronic, progressive, persistent low back, bilateral hip and upper thigh pain, limiting her mobility, associated with generalized lethargy without fevers or weight loss, um, found on exam to have evidence of OA in her hands, osteoarthritis in her hands, trochanteric tenderness, and slight weakness in the L1, L4 distribution. Not clear whether that's from pain or whether that's a neurologic problem. The rest of her neurologic exam um, sounds pretty normal. And, and in regard to anosmia, anybody, if I ever saw somebody write, you know, anosmia um, negative or something like that, the only thing more fudged than that would be a JVP. <laughs> JVP is the most fudged physical finding in the history of medicine. Um, but in any case, that's where we're at in terms of our problem representation. So we don't seem to have got too much further on this case yet. Am, <laughs> I, am I correct here? Although we, we, our, our 
differentials become kind of broad to a little less broad, I would think. So now we're going to, we've got, we're able to have a couple of bedside tests on Miss Dartmouth Merman. Um, ECG, sinus rhythm, nothing abnormal detected, a blood sugar of five. But we dip her urine uh, and she's got um, some proteinuria and some glycosuria. Oh, her BSL was five. No leukocytes, nitrites, or red cells. Microscopy shows no casts or bacteria, and her VBG is normal. Pass it back to these chaps. I think a urine was reasonable to do in this particular case because some of the things on our differential were around renal disease, um, that kind of thing. So I do think that was, that was an important thing to do. Yeah, and I think the urine, the results of the urine, for me, are very significant. Uh, it's, the, it's just the kind of test that you, you know, when you talk about elephants versus red herrings, this is definitely an elephant in the sense that you can't just blow it off. You can't just say, geez, I don't know why there's glucose in the urine. Um, oh, well, you know, let's move on. You, ha you have to account for that in some way. And to be perfectly honest, the only thing that comes to mind when I know that there's glucose in the urine is diabetes. I mean, that, that's the only thing I can think of. But then you have a normal blood glucose, and I know that the only way that you get glucose in the urine is because your blood glucose is too high and you're spilling over. And if that's not true, then there's something else, there's something else happening. So in any case, we thought, this is definitely an elephant, we cannot ignore it, and we have to start thinking about why you would get spillage of glucose and other stuff in the urine. Hmm. <coughs> right. Our next test that we order up in Broome uh, is we get um, an X-ray of her pelvis and her hips because we're quite concerned about this pain, obviously. It's very kindly been uh, reported in not at all a patronising way by the radiologist with arrows everywhere, like we're stupid. Um, but so very kindly has put some arrows there and he's even give us a, given us a report uh, which says, reported as osteopenia with signs of osteomalacia multiple stress fractures involving the pubic rami and femoral neck, consistent with looser zones slash pseudo fractures. There is no evidence of sacroiliitis or malignant lesions or metastases. And I hope you can all have a little look at uh, where the radiologist kindly pointed to. This is really sort of open lines and they're, they're, they're referred to as uh, either milkman zones or, or looser zones. We have a lumbar spine, um, I don't have the images of those because Broom had a little bit of trouble with their PAC system. They couldn't upload them, I'm afraid. Uh, lumbar spine, old crush fracture to L4 vertebral body with 15 to 20% loss of height with no retropulsion or erosive malignant lesions, obvious. She had an ultrasound of her renal tract because they're actually quite advanced up there and they can do that. Um, bilateral small kidneys, homogenous appearance with no focal scars, with normal Doppler flow and an incidental three millimetre stone in the inferior pole of her left kidney. The chest X-ray was reported as normal and there were no further imaging, including CT, MR or bone scans available for this case. So I think we've explained her pain. Um, and so our problem representation now becomes a 60-year-old healthy vegan woman with associated, uh, sorry, with associated with, uh, with multiple stress fractures due to osteopenia slash osteomalacia, proteinuria, glycosuria without diabetes. And the reason why this um, problem representation, why this is such an important process is because this is how we trigger illness scripts. The closer we can get, the more accurate we can get this, the more likely it is that we may ping something in our brains, a pattern in our brains that we recognize. So uh, can, in can terms I just say, of- Sorry, sorry yeah. can I just say that you'll notice from the problem representation that we've dropped all of those symptoms and the progression of symptoms over the course of three months, and we've substituted that with stress fractures from osteomalacia, and this points 
this points to this process that we do, which is we actually, we're using the best information that we have at any given moment. So as soon as we know, or as soon as we're assuming that all of that pain and all of those symptoms is due to a more objective piece of information that we now have, we substitute that into the problem representation. Yeah, so this should really be at the level of which you're certain of the information, okay? Um, so now we have to think about a differential diagnosis for osteopenia and osteomalacia. Um, this clearly isn't likely to be genetic in this woman or else she would have probably presented with fractures earlier. Um, there are lots of endocrine problems that can cause osteopenia and osteomalacia, and I've listed them there. Um, there's lots of metabolic stuff, and when I'm thinking about metabolism and metabo metabolic illnesses for osteomalacia, I'm thinking about calcium or I'm thinking about phosphate. And whenever I'm thinking about a, an electrolyte, I'm thinking, well, what's the problem? Is, it, is there too much? Is there too little? If there's too little, um, then is it because they're not taking in enough? Is there some sort of uh, intracorporeal shift? Uh, or are they losing it somewhere? Um, so in terms of metabolic things, I'm thinking about low calcium um, and I'm thinking about low phosphate. Uh, and that may tie in with the renal losses that we know is going on in terms of her proteinuria uh, and in terms of her glycosuria. So we now have got a few blood tests coming back on our screen um, that were ordered when when she was last seen. Um, really, the, the main abnormalities are that we've got a, a low haemoglobin at 101, not terribly exciting. It's a normocytic, normochromic picture with no signs of hemolysis, etc. Normal white cell count and differentials, platelets 255. She's a normal sodium of 141, a potassium of 4.9, but she, her chloride is up at 111. She has some renal impairment. Urea is 11.1 .1 and creatinine is 130. Uh, that's kind of, kind of interesting. We remember back that she had these small kidneys on ultrasound. Her LFTs are mostly normal, except for an alkaline phosphatase, which is significantly elevated, about three times normal, or four times normal at 370. Slightly low protein with normal albumin. Calcium 2.25, normal. Vitamin D, can, they were testing that in Broome, um, 79, normal. But her parathyroid hormone's elevated at 7. Um, oh, it's only just a tiny bit up. Now, we also, because we try to get in good with our intensivist friends, we ordered a phosphate, even though we have no idea why we do phosphates or what that even means, and it's come back as low. Um, the magnesium is also a little bit low as well. Um, the ESR is seven, the CRP, someone did a CRP and it's 17. I mean, I think it's always 17. Uh, it's like, you know, house, it's always lupus. This is, oh, oof, giving anything away yet? I don't think so. Um, the ANA is negative and the uric acid is elevated at 0.52. Not horrendously, but high. Her hemoglobin um, A1C is 5.1% normal, so she's had pretty, her sugars weren't just normal that time, but they've been normal for quite some time. So now, over to the, the clever people. Yeah. Okay, <clears throat> well, we're getting to the end of this now. So um, there's just a few interesting things that we noticed. Uh, once again, the hemoglobin A1C, the blood glucose, normal, so she's not diabetic. That's not explaining the loss of glucose in the urine. Um, Raised alkaline phosphatase, could it be increased bone turnover? But I guess we have a sort of an explanation for that already because we know that there's osteomalacia, so there could be some activity there. Um, normal calcium vitamin D, so whatever is causing this bone problem is not from that. Uh, we talked about the proteinuria and the glucosuria, and now we have a low phosphate and so we're thinking about that phosphate loss in the, in the kidney. So this is sort of what we've come up with now from that differential for osteomalacia. Um, Hyperparathyroidism, but it wasn't really high, the PTH. Well, it was, I think, uh, it was high because the phosphate was low. So it's a secondary. So it's a secondary right. process. Yeah, and then renal losses. So now we've got 
loss of phosphate in the, in the urine, loss of glucose, loss of protein, and this all points at the proximal tubule. Something is wrong with the proximal tubule and you're just losing this stuff. Is there anything else? So the broom laboratory people got really excited too when they sort of saw that urine and as is their want, they delved deeper into that urine, looked a little more closely because they were trying to figure out what was going on as well. They looked, they gave us a spot urine protein creatinine ratio at 288. That is really high, normal is less than 13. Once again, they detected urinary glucose. They did a quantitative electrophoresis of urinary protein. Uh, they, they decided to do that themselves because they were very interested in the protein. Um, and it showed a little bit of albuminuria, but they picked up a very high level of ooh, beta-2 microglobulinuria, really high. Um, it's, that's not something I, in emergency uh, order, very often or really have any idea of its significance. The normal range is under 200. But uh, they, in particular, they made note that there were no Bentz Jones proteins or light chains within that uh, electrophoresis panel. <coughs> so that comes to the end of the information that we are able to give you about Miss Ms. Dartmouth Merman. Um, so it's back to the chumps. Right, so this is where it gets interesting. So problem representation number five, a 60-year-old healthy vegan woman with associate, with, I could have fixed that, uh, <laughs> uh, associated with multiple stress fractures due to osteomalacia, proteinuria, glycosuria, and hypophosphatemia. Now, fortunately for me, I've got a fairly short differential for that, and it, it did ping an illness script for me. It may not ping an illness script for you, but fortunately, because you've done all this hard work and you've now got this accurate problem representation, you can put these search terms into Google and Dr. Google will help you come up with the diagnosis, right? We all have to get over this idea that we can keep everything in our heads and that all the diagnoses we need to know are in our heads. They are not. There's far more information uh, on the internet than we can ever keep in our heads. So um, what we thought of was um, Fanconi syndrome. That's the um, problem where you have a loss of lots and lots of things in the proximal tubules, which can lead to osteomalacia. Now that in and of itself has its own differential, which we will get to. Um, there's inherited causes of Fanconi syndrome, which I don't think she has because she would have come to medical attention earlier. There are acquired ones like multiple myeloma and that protein electrophoresis didn't show and the Bench Jones, the absence of Bench Jones proteins didn't suggest multiple myeloma. She doesn't have nephrotic range proteinuria and that is, a, is another differential diagnosis. But the thing, and she's not on very many medications, but the thing, if you look at this list, the thing that's interesting is that heavy metal intoxication can cause Fanconi syndrome. Now, we know that she takes copper. We know that she drinks well water. We know that she's got an anemia. We know that she's got Fanconi syndrome. So putting this all together, we think and hope, or else we're going to look really foolish. No, I, see, I think, this, <laughs> I love this slide so much <laughs> that, you know, even if the answer is not. Yeah, it's, it's the process, I'm right? Okay with it. And we're jet lagged, yeah. so. <laughs> um, we think that the answer is that she has low back pain due to these multiple stress fractures, due to osteomalacia, due to hypophosphatemia, which is part of Fanconi syndrome. That's Guido Fanconi, by the way. He was a Swiss pediatrician. And we think that this is due to heavy metal, right? Not listening to too much of it, but 
ingesting too much of it. And we don't know what's in broom, but we suspect if you checked her for heavy metals, you would find heavy metal intoxication. But where are the potential, because one of the potential sources is maybe the copper that she's taking is not regulated like other medications might be. So there might be more than just copper. But she, she took the copper as a result of these symptoms. She's, the symptoms became before the copper. And so for this process to take place, it must have been an awfully long time in coming, I think. Um, so lead is a possibility on that. Uh, we know that she's anemic. They don't mention basophilic stippling, but basophilic stippling is something that's reasonably specific for lead intoxication. So um, there's still a few things that don't, that don't fit. There are a few things that, that don't fit. Um, the, well, w with can, Fanconi we... syndrome, you would expect what? You'd expect a renal tubular acidosis because you're losing bicarb in the proximal tubules as well. And her venous blood gas didn't show that. What else would you? The uric acid. You expect to have low uric acid. And yep. Her... You lose uric acid. Her uric acid was, if anything, a little bit high. Mm. So there are some things that don't quite fit with Fanconi syndrome, but I think overall the gestalt is, the pattern is that it's more in keeping with that than not. Hmm. Very good. Drum roll, please. <laughs> Before, oh. <laughs> Ha, 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 don't, you'll be doing that for a while, you get sore hands. Um, not yet. Uh, so before we actually s sort of wrap this up, I'd like to actually put it out to the audience, whether anyone had any additional thoughts. I think the chaps have done incredibly well, um, but was there, did anyone else have any ideas or thoughts following through that script of clinical reasoning? Um, I do like the idea of uh, heavy metals. Does anyone have any idea about broom or any thoughts at all? We have one down there. Yes, shout. The well. Okay, the well. What do you think might be in the well? So broom was def de definitely has certainly um, uh, um, artesian water that's fed in from um, areas that are used for mining. Anything else? What else was broom famous for? Anyone? So eat pearls, absolutely. There's a lot of pearl mining, a lot of hippies. Do you mine pearls? Uh, you dive for pearls, yes. Oh, yeah, Good okay. thinking. <laughs> dive for pearls. Uh, anything else? There was war things that went on. World War II, they had a lot of uh, base, they had uh, bases up there and they had uh, a few plane crashes and all sorts of weird things. Anyway, moving on. Let's just take a little bit of a look. The, the, the chumps have re rightly said we had a real focus on her lifestyle, and why was that? Well, I have found another example of her wonderful art um, that she's been uh, um, spruiking at the broom markets. Her paintings all used natural pastels. She's held on to these paints for a long time, all of them with bright orange and yellow pigments. This is another example of her lovely handmade jewellery. Uh, she made her own jewellery using a soldering iron in a poorly ventilated studio. Oh, are those yeah. kiss pendants? They are kiss pendants. Wow. I know. You don't wow. find those. I don't think I can go back. You don't find those many places. <laughs> um, she travelled extensively to the Toyama Prefecture in Japan for her meditation where an epidemic of eye tie, eye tie disease had occurred in the 20th century. What the hell is that? And the well from which Gwen wait, sourced wait, to... Oh, what, what OK, is, <laughs> we're going to come back to that. What is that? It's oh, okay, all yeah, leading to one thing. Oh. So the, before we t I tell you what it actually was, uh, I think we need to give a, a round of applause to the chumps who not only have actually pretty much got the diagnosis, but have come all the way from New Zealand just to show us how to do it. So, well done. <laughs> all of these lifestyle uh, uh, things of Ms. Dartmouth Merman have one single element in common, cadmium. 
So cadmium uh, is a heavy metal which causes exactly the things that you talked about. It does cause acquired Fanconi syndrome. All of her symptoms were related to her Fanconi syndrome, the bones, the kidneys. There's a couple of weird things that cadmium does, just out of interest. The orange pigments for, for most of uh, sort of the Renaissance period and all great artists used cadmium-based orange and yellow pigments in their painting. Monet particularly, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Ma um, Magritte, uh, all, um, Monk, etc., all used cadmium pigments because they, their brilliance, the brilliance in the yellow outlasted anything else. They've sadly tried to uh, ban cadmium from, from paint pigments um, to a great uproar across the world, but good old Ms. Dartmouth Merman has kept her paints for a very long time. Um, the Ite, Ite disease, uh, interestingly, in the 20th century, is the greatest uh, um, epidemiological study of chronic cadmium toxicity toxicity uh, in one of the basins in the Jinzu pro um, province uh, because of mining um, uh, and, and uh, concentration of cadmium in the water. There, there was this huge uh, outbreak of, uh, itai, itai means ouch, ouch, and all these women who had chronic cadmium poisoning were waddling around uh, and, and dying from their cadmium poisoning. It was obviously worse than waddling. <laughs> it's very bad, it's very bad. Um, the and, ultimate ouch. <laughs> yes, extremely ouch related. Uh, the soldering is one of, uh, um, cadmium is also used in some of the silver alloys in homemade jewellery, so in um, poorly ventilated uh, places, you you can inhale the fumes um, of the cadmium, uh, and the well was um, where, in, in certainly some mining techniques, cadmium has also been used. Obviously, we know about cadmium from batteries. Um, all of these things, so poor Gwen, Gwendolyn, had been exposed to cadmium for a very long time, but indeed it was uh, Fanconi syndrome. Um, so they they got it. They were unstumped. Um, <laughs> does anyone have any questions before we finish? <laughs> <laughs>